Um, hi everyone, welcome to our launch this evening. Um, thank you very much for being here. We are of course here to launch a new Carcanet classic, the Poems and Satires of Edna St. Vincent Millay. Um, we are joined by the book's editor, Tristram Fane Saunders, and we're also joined by poet Abigail Parry, um, who is a fan of Millay. Um, they're both going to read for us this evening from Millay's work, and they're going to discuss um, her, her writing and the book later on. Um, so before I hand over to them, I'm just going to let you know what's going to happen tonight. Um, obviously, we can't see you. Um, I've put some messages in the chat already. Um, please find the chat box, say hello to us, let us know where you're watching from, let us know what you think of the reading um, and the, of the event in general. Um, we want to get you involved in the conversation. So um, find the chat, say hello. Uh, also, please find the Q&A box. It's a different button. Um, later in the event, there'll be time to take some audience questions. Um, Abby's going to put those to Tristram so you can ask him about editing or anything about Millet. Um, if you get those in the Q&A box, then we can answer them later on in the event. Um, now, while Abby and Tristram are reading, I'm going to have the text up on the screen. I'm the text's going to be up for the duration of the event tonight. Um, so do be aware that you can reconfigure your own screen. If their faces aren't big enough for you, if you need to lip read or anything, you should be able to drag the corners of the box and reconfigure the screen to suit your needs. If you have any technical questions about any of this stuff, just pop them in the chat throughout the event um, and we'll do our best to help you there. So um, before we jump into the readings and discussion, I'll introduce our speakers tonight. The book's editor, Tristram Fane Saunders, uh, lives in London. He works as a journalist. His poems appear in our very own New Poetry's Eight, um, Carcanet's anthology, which came out earlier this year. Um, and his latest pamphlet is Woodsong, which came out with Smith Doorstop in 2019. Um, he is currently the Telegraph's poetry critic, so you can read his work in there. Abigail Parry spent seven years as a toy maker before completing her doctoral thesis on wordplay. Her poems have been set to music, translated into Spanish and Japanese, broadcast on BBC and RT radio, and widely published in journals and anthologies. She's won a number of prizes and awards for her work, including the Bally Malo Prize, the Troubadour Prize, and an Eric Gregory Award. And her first collection, Jinx, which came out with Blood Axe in 2018, um, that was shortlisted for the Forward Prize for, first best, for Best First Collection. Um, and it was also shortlisted for the Seamus Heaney Centre First Collection Prize. So if you don't know her work, definitely go and check it out um, and you will be rewarded. So um, you can see you're finding the chat. Hi, everyone. That's cool. Um, thanks for getting involved. Um, we're going to begin now. So I'm going to invite Tristram on screen uh, to join me and we'll begin. Hello, thank you all for tuning in. Um, I'm, I'm the editor of Edna St. Vincent Millay Poems and Satires, and it's a, a, it's a selection and a celebration of Millay's work. I wanted to present, I, I think, a, a more uh, varied portrait of, of her work than people are often familiar with. The few friends who I've spoken to who said that the fans of Millay's poetry are usually only familiar with a, a handful of her earlier poems, but this, book is kind of intended as, uh, on, on the one hand, a sort of primer to everything she wrote through her life, as well as her poetry. She wrote an extraordinary anti-war play to, called Aria de Capo, which is included here in its entirety, as well as some hilariously funny short stories and spoof agony art letters, which she published under a pseudonym in the 1920s. So I've included a selection of those too. But I thought the best place to begin uh, this evening would be with her poetry and in particular her sonnets which are her best known work but also i think uh should give you a, a vivid sense of the um the arch ironic witty uh surprising personality that also comes through in her satires i wanted to both make a case for Millet's uh variety and range as a writer but also to really emphasize her wit and satirical streak and this kind of mischievous quality that goes through a lot of her work. She can be a profoundly moving poet, but also often an intensely funny poet. And the first poem that we're going to start with tonight, which Abigail Parry will be reading, I, I think really shows that side of her. Uh, this is a sonnet called, I Being Born a Woman and Distress. Hello, I, th I think that's my cue, isn't it, Tristan? I think so. <laughs> 
you want to talk, talk a bit about it first, or do you want to dive in? Yeah, because obviously, I mean, we picked mm. it first, um, so so why don't we talk a little bit about that and about the fact that it's you know I think it's probably the most the most widely anthologized certainly of her sonnets anyway, and I think there's a reason for that, or I think there are reasons for that. Um, I think I think it does well, at least two things that are pretty quintessentially Millet things. So um, on the one hand, it's 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 just a sizzling kiss off, right? It's it's like the most savage dear John letter in the whole of poetry, and I think I think when you think of Millet or when you think of Millet's sonnets for sure, um, then what you think of is exactly that that sort of wicked pair of scissors um, that can just snip someone, some, some hapless suitor out of consideration. Um, so it's that, or at least one thinks, I, I think of that, that combination of, of, uh, of formal control and detachment, um, or at least the performance of detachment. Um, so there's that, but also um, it's, um, it enacts that, um, that tension that you see uh, in all of her work and which you talk about very brilliantly in your introduction um, that has to do with being like a, a thinking reasoning thing um, in a human body um, and, and how ridiculous a predicament that is to be to be like a reasonable person but, um, mm. but like puppeting this meat sock <laughs> that has like all its, all its needs and notions um, and, 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 and there's an ignominy to that um, and one of the reasons I love this poem is it's very good. It's, it's very good at capturing that balance between those two things. Um, that is my thinking on the subject anyway. Mm. I, I think this poem uh, really captures uh, a kind of tension, a paradox that's present in a lot of her sonnets, where she's on the one hand declaring herself to be kind of a, a, above and beyond love and desire and looking down at you know the messes that we get ourselves into through our relationships in a kind of detached and sardonic way and yet still ending up in them herself she is on, on the one hand able to say oh you know I'll, i will i shall forget you presently my dear so another sonnet begins and there's a suggestion that none of her kind of encounters really mean anything to her which at the time right, when she was publishing these in the early 1920s was I, I think it's easy to underestimate how daring that was as as a stance to take and people were excited and engaged by it but there's always a, a sense that it's a performance and it's a stance and we're kind of encouraged to doubt that and question that, I think, when you read the, her sonnets back to back, that we see kind of cracks in this persona, of it, this kind of cool, aloof, witty exterior. Yeah, um, sure. I, I think, and some of the sonnets we'll be looking at uh, later in, in, in this reading, I think, show a bit more of her kind of vulnerability. But I, I definitely think this one is her um, at her kind of most powerful guns blazing. As you say, it's, it's a brilliant kiss off. <laughs> yeah, do it, just gone with it. Mm. <laughs> All righty. <clears throat> I, being born a woman and distressed by all the needs and notions of my kind, am urged by your propinquity to find your person fair and feel a certain zest to bear your body's weight upon my breast. So subtly is the fume of life designed to clarify the pulse and cloud the mind and leave me once again undone, possessed. Think not for this, however, the poor treason of my stout blood against my staggering brain. I shall remember you with love or season my scorn with pity. Let me make it plain. I find this frenzy insufficient reason for conversation when we meet again. That was wonderful. I, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> I it was my first time we spent a while talking about which poems we're going to read and, and what we'll be discussing between the poems, but I, I hadn't actually heard you read 
uh, any of the poems aloud. So this is this is as much a treat for me, I, I think, as as it hopefully is for everyone watching this evening. Um, now, th the next one I wanted to talk about is only until this cigarette is ended, which oh. um, is kind of falls into the subgenre of her "I shall forget you presently" poems, where she, it's addressed to a, a lover or something less than lover. It's presenting uh, the the relationship they've had as something transient, something fleeting, something not of necessarily deep importance to the poet. And that that's the note at which it starts out on, but then starts to, the, the sense of concealed feeling or attention between what feeling and performed feeling starts to emerge. She repeatedly says that I shall forget you, I will forget you, I forget all these things about you, until we reach the crucial line in the poem, I think, for me. Um, the, she says, oh, okay, forget the color, forget the features of your face. The words, not ever that not everything uh, can or will be forgotten. I think I, rather than waffling uh, too much about this, I might just plunge straight in and, and read it to you. Apologies if I'm seeming a little bit nervous. I still haven't quite entirely got the hang of Zooms. Um, <laughs> only until this cigarette is ended. A little moment at the end of all. While on the floor the quiet ashes fall, and in the firelight to a lance extended, bizarrely with the jazzing music blended, the broken shadow dances on the wall. I will permit my memory to recall the vision of you by all my dreams attended. And then, adieu, farewell, the dream is done. Yours is a face of which I can forget the color and the features, every one. The words, not ever. And the smiles, not yet. But in your day, this moment is the sun upon a hill after the sun has set. Gorgeous. <laughs> and now the, the next sonnet that we're going to talk about is one that I think strikes a very different tone. And a a Abby, you said this is one that you're particularly keen to discuss, uh, her poem Bluebeard. Could, could you tell me why you were so excited to, to read this one this evening? Yeah, no, I, I think I hustled for that, for this. Oh, I, I don't think I needed to hustle because I know you love it as well. But, but this one is, a, a, I would have hustled if you hadn't been amenable to it. This is one of my favourite of her poems. And in fact, it's one of my favourite poems. Um, because, 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 because what it names is, is so precise. Um, and it's something that's really incredibly difficult to talk about. Um, because it's a scenario that comes up um, in intimate relationships. Um, but we have only really the crudest tools to work with when we try and describe this. And she gives this brilliant concrete metaphor here. So uh, unusually for one of Malay's sonnets, it has a title. Um, and the title is Bluebeard. Um, and obviously everyone has had a go on Bluebeard. Um, but what Malay does with it, I think is, is pretty unique. Um, in that here where, where the room is, is breached, where the transgression occurs, um, and, and the sonnet itself obviously is a room, like all sonnets are rooms. So, so when the person enters this room, um, what they find is that there's nothing there. <laughs> like there was, there was nothing there ever beyond the interdiction, beyond the instruction not to enter. Um, and to my mind, this is, this is what we mean really when, you know, in, 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 our, in our own relationships, we, we, we say things like back off or, or, you know, I need some space or, um, or, or, or I just need this for myself. Um, and, and this really, to my mind, is what, is what we're trying to say. Um, so I find it useful in that way, I guess is what I mean. Um, anyway, here we go. This door you might not open, and you did. So enter now and see for what slight thing you are betrayed. Here is no treasure hid, no cauldron, no clear crystal mirroring the sought for truth. No heads of women slain for greed like yours. 
no writhings of distress, but only what you see. Look yet again, an empty room, cobwebbed and comfortless. Yet this alone out of my life I kept unto myself, lest any know me quite. And you did so profane me when you crept unto the threshold of this room tonight, that I must never more behold your face. This now is yours. I seek another place. Oh, it's just terrific, isn't it? <laughs> she does a killer last line to Jura. <laughs> like, show me a poet. Mm. One of those as well. <laughs> uh, one, one of the things I love about her is just the, the music and the formal control of the poet. She's someone who knows that um, the, the way you can place this is or turn a line or manipulate a line break uh, can, it, it, it's, it, it, there's a kind of musical finesse that only comes from being totally at ease with these. I kind of think that she, she must have thought in sonnets. There's, a, there's, there's one sonnet in here, which I'm, I'm a total geek for anything to do with meters. And there's the sonnet which we're not reading this evening, but one beginning with the line, sorrowful dreams remembered after waking, where every line of the sonnet begins with an inverted foot and it creates this amazing uh, rhythm. It's almost like being pounded by wave after wave. Um, and so, even uh, critics who aren't so keen on Malay usually will, will concede that she was kind of a, a master of formal control, but she also uh, wrote some really, I, I think, quite brilliant free verse. And the next poem that I, I'd like to read is, um, oh no, actually, sorry, I realize I've got my running order uh, slightly wrong. We'll be getting to that in a minute. Just before that, though, we have to, we have to do what lips my lips have kissed and where and why, don't we? In, in terms of, uh, sonnets where she's really giving you the, the music of the form, I think this is right up there. Uh, should we have, sh before we start talking about reverse, should we, should we have what lips my lips have kissed and where and why? Yeah, let's do it. It's, I mean, it's a, this tonally is very different. This is how we're justifying having used so many sonnets, right? Because they're so brilliant. Mm. Um, but, but tonally it's different. This is, this is a much more subdued sonnet, right? This mm. is only until this cigarette has ended or um, I being born a woman, here the gaze is, you know, it's not on. It's not on the the hapless snippy. It's on. Um, it's on. It's on the speaker, and um, and so it's got. It's a very different sort of tone, I think. Anyway. <clears throat> what lips my lips have kissed, and where, and why? I have forgotten. And what arms have lain under my head till morning. But the rain is full of ghosts tonight that tap and sigh upon the glass and listen for reply. And in my heart there stirs a quiet pain for unremembered lads that not again will turn to me at midnight with a cry. Thus in the winter stands the lonely tree, nor knows what birds have vanished one by one, yet knows its boughs more silent than before. I cannot say what loves have come and gone. I only know that summer sang in me a little while, that in me sings no more. Now let's talk about her brilliant lyrics. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, and uh, I, I actually I, I think a, a point kind of worth making is there are a, a, one comment that's of, often been made about her poetry is that she has the, the two kind of she has two themes which are arguably the two primal themes of of lyric poetry that she returns to a kind of almost incessantly. Mo most of her poems touch on either love or death, and so far we've been looking mainly at Malay, the love poet. Um, but the next poem I'm going to read, Childhood is the Kingdom Where Nobody Dies, is, I, I think, a quite remarkable poem about death and about how uh, the experience of mourning changes us. And it's written with uh, a, a kind of 
faux simplicity and what seems at first a kind of almost offhand playfulness that as the poem uh, continues turns into something I find quite profoundly moving. I made the mistake for preparing uh, for, for this event of actually going back and listening again to Malay reading the poem. And if, if any of you have a Spotify account, there are several recordings of her reading her own poetry on there. And she reads it brilliantly. I, I, I should say she was a captivating performer of her own work. Her, and, and her and Robert Frost kind of between them, I think, pioneered the celebrity poet book tour. She'd travel around America um, performing to audiences of thousands. There was one theatre they, where they had to set up exterior speakers outside the building so the crowd outside could hear her because they just couldn't get enough people in. And her performance of this is brilliant, but also has a kind of swooping up and down delivery that I'll, once you've heard it, it's a complete earworm. I'll try my very best not to imitate that for you tonight. Uh, this is Childhood is the Kingdom Where Nobody Dies. Childhood is not from birth to a certain age, and at a certain age the child is grown and puts away childish things. Childhood is the kingdom where nobody dies. Nobody that matters, that is. Distant relatives, of course, die, whom one has never seen or has seen for an hour, and they gave one candy in a pink and green striped bag or a jackknife and went away, and cannot really be said to have lived at all. And cats die. They lie on the floor and lash their tails, and their reticent fur is suddenly all in motion with fleas that one never knew were there, polished and brown, knowing all there is to know, trekking off into the living world. You fetch a shoebox, but it's much too small because she won't curl up now, so you find a bigger box and bury her in the yard and weep. But you do not wake up a month from then, two months, a year from then, two years, in the middle of the night and weep, with your knuckles in your mouth, and say, oh God, oh God. Childhood is the kingdom where nobody dies that matters. Mothers and fathers don't die. And if you have said, for heaven's sake, must you always be kissing a person? Or, I do wish to gracious you'd stop tapping on the window with your thimble. Tomorrow, or even the day after tomorrow, if you're busy having fun, is plenty of time to say, I'm sorry, mother. To be grown up is to sit at the table with people who have died, who neither listen nor speak who do not drink their tea, though they always said tea was such a comfort. Run down into the cellar and bring up the last jar of raspberries. They are not tempted. Flatter them, ask them what it was they said exactly that time to the bishop or to the overseer or to Mrs. Mason. They are not taken in. Shout at them, get red in the face, rise, drag them up out of their chairs by the stiff shoulders, and shake them and yell at them. They are not startled. They are not even embarrassed. They slide back into their chairs. Your tea is cold now. You drink it standing up and leave the house. Lovely. Uh, I've got to say that that poem is one of the poems that made me want to uh, uh, grab my editor, Michael Schmidt, by the collar and say, please, can we do this book? Um, because it's it's one of my favourite Malay poems and it, it, it wasn't in the previous uh, Carcanet selection, which is, is a tremendous selection, but it's got sort of different uh, emphasis to it. And this was, I, I felt, th there were two or three poems that I felt absolutely from day one of choosing the contents for this had to go in. And, and for me, that's that's one of them. Um, this is fun for me because it, it's never one I, I would have picked out. Um, but do you, you must find this, Justin, that if, if someone else really loves something, a poem or a song by yeah. a band you really like, then you get to sort of enjoy it in a, in a double way. Mm. You, you sort of enjoy it through the lens of, of someone else loving that poem. Um, so I'm glad you included that too. Um, shall we talk a bit about spring? 
Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah, it's, it's not just it's not just T.S. Eliot who had it in for April. <laughs> no, indeed. Um, again, it's not one I would have picked out, but actually, when I was um, like thinking on it in the lead up to this event, I, I realised I, I, I just I, I like this one so much more than I ever believed I did. Mm. I, I think it's an, an, an extraordinarily unusual poem for her. It feels, even though there's a, there's a similar uh, sharpness and spikiness to it that you, you find in some of her other poems, formally it feels uh, very different. And this is um, th this is from actually one of one of her earliest books, Second uh, April, which she. Um, she, it, the publication history of it is kind of interesting. She had it ready to go. And I, I think the first publisher she sent it to was very wary about the, the darkness of the book and it's kind of focus on death. And while that was held up in the press and she was waiting to find a home for it, she suddenly found she had a bestseller on her hands with a much shorter book called A Few Figs from Thistles, which contains some of her funniest poetry. So when uh, Second April finally came out, people opened it and saw this and felt it was it was an entirely different poet to the Malay they knew from from her kind of more uh, entertaining sonnets, I think. Mm -hmm. I think this is her in, in, in a very different style and voice. It, I mean, it treats death in an interesting way, though. I, I, I was Ooh. very taken with, in your introduction, you make the point that, that actually death in, in Malay's work um, is, is, is negation, really. It's like negation, mm. vibrancy of... Of, of life and I think that's right I, I mean I think that's right and I think that's evident in this poem um but I think I mean I like this poem because we all know this really April's really twee right <laughs> like, like we're supposed to like it there's loads of nice things like sort of buds and lambs and 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 you know there's a great sense of rebirth but actually it's it's quite twee I think. So, so I like this poem just as a, a bit of a fuck you to, uh, <laughs> to all the nice things about April. But anyway, um, shall I read it? Uh, yes, please. Spring. To what purpose, April? Do you return again? Beauty is not enough. You can no longer quiet me with the redness of little leaves opening stickily. I know what I know. The sun is hot on my neck as I observe the spikes of the crocus. The smell of the earth is good. It is apparent that there is no death. But what does that signify? Not only underground are the brains of men eaten by maggots. Life in itself is nothing. An empty cup, a flight of uncarpeted stairs. It is not enough that yearly down this hill, April comes like an idiot, babbling and strewing flowers. I think um, I've, I've thought of Malay's work before that, um, that actually in some ways it'd be more useful to have an index of last lines um, mm. Index of first lines because I, I think I think there are many poems and this is one of them where where, where actually people would recognise that um, that that, mm. that that's such a memorable last line and and there are quite a few of her lyrics that are that way I think oh. I think she's well I, I think one exception would be the next poem I'm going to read I think it people would recognise it most for its its first line which is repeated it's a it's it, as a kind of song-like refrain. I think I used the, the word earworm earlier talking about another um, an another of her poems, and this one is absolutely an earworm. We've, we've had several uh, this evening which have shown her in, in a kind of uh, slightly arch spiky mode. The, the next poem, Recuerdo, is, is I think her at her most joyful. 
this is a, a love poem that captures perfectly the kind of giddy elation you feel when you've just met someone who really excites you and it's it it it, it is is um I, I think a completely irresistible, mischievous, uplifting little song. I do say, um, you say little, but I. But oh yeah, I, sorry. I don't. I, I don't. I don't. Yeah, li little is entirely the wrong word. I know you uh, didn't yeah, think please, 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 don't correct me. No, no. I just because like, I know I know we've talked a bit before about how um, how the detachment, the apparent detachment, mm. is accepted. But similarly here, like it sort of walks and talks like a frivolous poem, but it's not. <laughs> It's um, it's it's it is joy. That is the right word. Anyway, over to you. We were very tired. We were very merry. We had gone back and forth all night on the ferry. It was bare and bright and smelled like a stable. But we looked into a fire. We leaned across a table. We lay on a hilltop underneath the moon, and the whistles kept blowing and the dawn came soon. We were very tired, we were very merry, we had gone back and forth all night on the ferry, and you ate an apple, and I ate a pear, from a dozen of each we had bought somewhere, and the sky went wan, and the wind came cold, and the sun rose dripping, a bucket full of gold. We were very tired, we were very merry, we had gone back and forth all night on the ferry. We hailed good morrow, mother, to a shawl-covered head, and bought a morning paper which neither of us read. And she wept, God bless you, for the apples and pears, and we gave her all our money but our subway fares. <laughs> I'm so glad you read that one. I, I don't think I could have done that. I certainly couldn't have done it as well as you. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, that's it's got a real like swaggering rhythm to it that, that I think would just turn to nothing in my mouth but um brilliant I can't remember what we have queued up next just um is it I think it might be an ancient gesture what? yes it is which is is a, a later poem um yeah did, would you like to sort of get the ball rolling with this one I mean, I, I, to be honest, I'd quite like to ask, because I, I think you conclude the lyric section with this. And so mm. I, because you've given it that privileged terminal position, I, I, like while I, was, um, while I was reading or reading over today, I was intrigued to know what that was. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Well, no, absolutely. I think there's, there's something which I, I maybe mentioned earlier and I kind of touched on in my introduction that where something that fascinates me and so I keep going back to in Blaise's poetry is this tension between feeling and performed feeling. I think she's always aware of poetry as an act of, of demonstrating an emotion and it's something stylized and secondhand but can also at the same time be representing something uh, immediate and firsthand and heartfelt and the the kind of tension between experience and artifice uh, I, I find interesting and this here also is um it's here, here it's framed kind of in I, I think it I think it's fair to say this is very much a, a feminist poem that she's I mean, in several of her poems she compares herself to uh Greek mythology and places her, her experiences in a kind of grand classical tradition but here she's doing something very different with that she's um, she's both uh, playing with the idea of sort of taking comfort in that, but also looking at how um, her own, well, how a, a very female experience of pain, she says, it, it is kind of appropriated and turned into something else. And how it's the, it's when, when the moment when a gesture becomes a gesture is the moment when it ceases to be something authentic. Yes. I, think, I think it's a poem that you can reread and take Many different things away from you can you can read it as a, a poem about loss. You can read it as a kind of uh, poem about how we interact with the past or the stories we tell ourselves. You can read it as, as I said a, as a kind of uh, feminist polemic if you want. But I think like lo like all of her best work, it, as soon as you say this is entirely completely about X, it starts to wriggle away from you slightly. You start to see new things that you can read into it. Um, yeah, I, I think that's 
uh, I, I, similarly, the, the very first poem in the book, um, her, her sonnet beginning, if I should learn in some quite casual way, I put at the front, partly for the same reasons. That's what I keep going back to and seeing new things in each time. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And also the potential of artifice to, 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 say, to say something quite sincere, or, or at mm. least say something, or, or indeed to say something that was at one point hot and charged. Mm. Um, that's, that's endlessly fascinating, I think. Mm. Um, sh sh shall I read this one, or would you like to? I, I'd be delighted if you did. You go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, an ancient, I've just realised I'm reading all the weepy ones. Um, <laughs> maybe that's because, maybe it was my sentimental streak coming out, I don't know. Uh, um, an ancient gesture. I thought, as I wiped my eyes on the corner of my apron, Penelope did this too. And more than once. You can't keep weaving all day and undoing it all through the night. Your arms get tired, and the back of your neck gets tight. And along towards morning, when you think it will never be light, and your husband has been gone and you don't know where for years, suddenly you burst into tears. There is simply nothing else to do. And I thought, as I wiped my eyes on the corner of my apron, this is an ancient gesture, classic. Greek, sorry, this is an ancient gesture, authentic, antique, in the very best tradition, classic, Greek. Ulysses did this too, but only as a gesture, a gesture which implied to the assembled throng that he was much too moved to speak. He learned it from Penelope, Penelope, who really cried. Brilliant. So I think we just have the one, the one more queued up to read, don't we, um, Tristram? Mm. And it's uh, like it's a return to the to the sonnets, but it was one that we both thought would make quite a fitting quite a fitting end um, and I guess I, 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 want, I want to ask you to talk about this a little bit because mm. um, because uh, the poem is not uh, up yet but the poem um, is I too beneath your moon almighty sex um, there we go um, which deals among other things in um, in, in the idea of uh, the persona as a construction, as something deliberately constructed, which, I mean, which again is something personally I find endlessly interesting, but you you write about this in your introduction um, in relation to Millet, the persona, um, mm. and Millet, the speaker here, and, and also more generally, I guess, um, uh, on behalf of the poet, the poet constructing something. Uh, so can you... <laughs> before, <laughs> before... I mean, it's... God, I, I think this is a this is a fascinating poem. This is one of her uh, later poems. From in, 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 in the last, there, there have been some selections in Lay's work where they only looks at her early stuff and nothing beyond the kind of mid twenties. This is her writing at, as as an older writer in in, in the thirties, and she um, I think it's it's a very much about the work of a poet. And it's kind of responding to or creating in order to respond to an audience and a readership and a sense of a, a disapproving public. The set, there's a, um, there, was a, there was an article a while ago that suggested Malay was, I, 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 want, I give the exact quote in my introduction that says, or better known for her persona as a party loving bisexual than for her poetry or words to that effect. And um, I think that the, the idea of living a life which is seen as scandalous by those around you is something that she's in, engaging with in this sonnet, but kind of de defiantly. And the, it, it, you could read it as a kind of manifesto 
for confessional poetry from a flawed life if, if you wanted to and read it very straightforwardly. The idea of this, this tower that she builds in the poem is the tower of her work. And she says it's built from bone and from her feelings. Um, and that without, you know, without, without the mess or maybe the kind of uh, less acceptable parts of that experience, there wouldn't be the tower of art that's come out of it. But I, again, as in so much of her work, there's the sense that that um, the, the, the mess and the feelings are also part of the constructed artifice themselves. So I, I'm aware I'm, yeah, I'm kind of taught you, God, this is something I could tie myself completely in knots over, both saying it is entirely her saying, here is my right to make my work out of my life, and you can't disapprove of my life without dismissing the work. <laughs> and a certain kind of winking acknowledgement that the life in itself is also something which is painted and portrayed and turned into art and stylized and kind of uh, invented in the work. Invented in the work, but also invented to the degree that we, we, we do this generally, to the degree that we, we, we present personas to a greater or lesser degree, I think. I mean, I mean I've, personally, I've always thought that, that poems and personas are, are quite congruent in that way, in that, in, that, in that they're both these sort of made things over which, over which their, their architect has quite incomplete control. Um, and so, so I think I think that, that this poem is very good at enacting that. I think mm. it does also tie into what, what uh, we were talking about earlier of the um, this kind of in intelligent mind trapped in this unreliable body. But it is also it's a poem about sexual desire, and yeah. there's that the kind of tension of being uh, dragged around by this body which has desires, while on some level feeling a little bit above it all is something that she returns to. Uh, quite often, there were. I mean, it's something in particularly in in her short satirical pieces. It's a theme that comes up time and time again, and she she's very funny about having a body. Uh, she in, in what. Uh, in one of her poems, oh no, in one, one of her satires, she gets fed up with the fact that she has to walk around on feet. Says, I don't like feet. Feet are unpleasant and there are too many toes on them. <laughs> so this idea of this brilliant mind that's also susceptible to passion and desire is something she's playing with there again, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the ignominy, the ignominy of having oh. 10 toes. I mean. <laughs> okay. I too, beneath your moon, almighty sex, go forth at nightfall, crying like a cat. Leaving the lofty tower I laboured at for birds to foul and boys and girls to vex with tittering chalk. And you and the long necks of neighbours sitting where their mothers sat are well aware of shadowy this and that in me that's neither noble nor complex. Such as I am, however, I have brought to what it is. This tower, it is my own. Though it was reared to beauty, it was wrought from what I had to build with. Honest bone is there, and anguish, pride, and burning thought, and lust is there, and nights not spent alone. And now, as as a kind of little um, palate cleanser before the Q and A. I thought we should talk a little bit about her um, the satires, which you know is the the other half of the book. We we focused on on the poetry for this just because some of the um, I mean so, some of the longer pieces are terrific. But if I, I if, if I read Aria de Capo, that would take up the whole hour. Um, so uh, with with I mean, and also you don't want me doing all of the voices and jumping up and up, up and down on tables and things. Well, may, maybe for another evening um, after I've had a couple more drinks in me. Uh, so. The as well as, well as the play Aria de Capo, the uh, the last section of the book is um, selections from a, a really unusual book called Distressing Dialogues, which is pieces that Malay had previously published uh, when she was one of Vanity Fair's star writers on, uh, as Nancy Boyd, this kind of alter ego that she created, and um, 
I, I think some of them are fantastically funny, but they also feel very true to the um, a, 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 a kind of snarky side to the Malay persona that really comes through in her letters. And so I'd like to give, I'd like to give you a bit of Malay just in her general correspondence, and then some of the uh, spoof letters which she wrote as this Nancy Boyd figure. It was among many other things, uh, an occasional Vanity Fair agony art, uh, solving questions which she also invented. Um, just... Are we short on time? Actually, I might I might say if you want to hear her, uh, are, are you worried that we're about to run out of time? I'm uh, in that case, Jazz. Could we actually flick to the um, the bit from uh, cordially yours? And if if people would like to see uh, Malay's correspondence, I, I quote it in the introduction to the book, which I believe is available tonight at a knockdown rate. So. Um, she, he, I'm just going to dive straight in with this, uh, with this piece, Cordially Yours. Um, if you are at a loss as to how to word it, study carefully our new impolite letter writer. I'm just going to give you two of these letters. One, letter to a letter to person who has made you a proposal of marriage, rejecting him. Sir, do you take me for an idiot? For four seasons I have parried the advances of the talented, the titled, the handsome as Apollo, and the verminous with wealth. It was me, for me Paderewski took up politics, for me D'Annunzio became a soldier. The Grand Duke Michael has be begged for my photograph in three languages and Russian. Freud has dreamed of me. Moratori has asked me to sing Celeste Ida to him by the hour. A communist once gave me his seat in a streetcar. A count has run off with my pocketbook. And a king has made a pun about me. For what do you think I am waiting? For you, be reasonable. As for the day we got caught in a shower on Lake George and were obliged to go ashore and seek shelter under the canoe together, I can only say that such accidents happen to us all. I take cold very easily and you were the only dry spot for miles around. Cordially yours. And then, for contrast, letter to person who has made you a proposal of marriage accepting him. Dear sir, it has been raining all day. Everybody received mail but me, and we had calf sprains for luncheon. I have been thinking over what you said. You are far from being my girlish ideal of a prince charming. If anybody had told me ten years ago that I should someday marry a man like yourself, I should have guffawed in her face. But there is no denying that I am twenty-eight years old and that my arms are getting thin. Of course, there are things about you that would drive me frantic in a month's time. The way you always let every car on the road get past you, for instance. The fact that you never know when the Victrola is running down. The way you always read aloud the passages in books which strike you as being funny. Sorry. And the fatuous way you have of talking about New York as if you had just given birth to it. But all men, even the clever and good looking ones, are irritating at times. On the whole, I have decided to take you. You are not so tall as I like them, but I think you are tall enough so that we won't look ridiculous together, and you have money enough so that I shall be able to dress twice as well as ever before. I look forward with eagerness to spending your money. Of course, it is a very serious decision that I am making. I am conscious that I am not bringing down what you would call a brilliant match, yet considering it carefully from all sides, the idea does not on the whole appear as great screamingly funny as at first it struck me. Cordially yours. P.S. I have a dreadful feeling that as soon as we are married you will begin calling me little woman. But if you bore me too much I can always get a divorce and I shall stand a much better chance the next time. <laughs> there we go. And I think now might be a, a, a moment to move on to audience questions perhaps okay okay so I, I believe it's um i believe it's my job to to pick out questions and put them to you tristan so forgive me everyone while i look slightly gormless while i um while i read the q a box um so tristan here's um here's here's one to start um holly pepper um asks, oh, obviously I've, um, I've, I've said how much I love the poem Bluebeard. She would like to know which is your favorite. 
my favorite poem um uh i think i think it the, the problem is with this question if you ask me on any other day you'll get a different answer but tonight i think it's i too beneath your moon or mighty sex and <laughs> if i was trying to introduce one of my friends who'd never heard of malay and make the case for her being an, an exciting writer who should be kind of part of your internal pantheon of writers you turn to for inspiration and to remind yourself of all that can be thrilling in poetry. I think that's a, both a good introduction to her persona and her work and, and, and to poetry generally. I think it's hard to read it without just going, wow. I do agree with that, but do you not think, so I know, I know I've mentioned before um, that, um, that, that, so that the poem that we did not read tonight, but that is also very famous, that the one that begins, if I should learn in some quite casual way, mm. I know I, I I think I was the one that um, said perhaps we shouldn't read it because I always think that poem as being quite quite meta Malay and like it, it I think it demands familiarity of, with her work to 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 get the gag as it were mm. um, that the contingency is so strained and the poem is so teetering that it earns from 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 the reader being familiar with Malay sonnets. Do you not think the same about? Sorry, I realise <laughs> you're only. No, I mean, I, I... Your favorite, but I, I, I can see what you mean of that it is <laughs> arguably a poem which expects a certain kind of familiarity with that persona but something I think it does so well is kind of constructing that persona within the poem yes but it kind of tells you here's who I am and, and what I think about writing yeah I think um, da, da, da. um Martin Stone asks um uh, this, sorry to this is very much putting you on the spot by asking these questions, <laughs> but um, uh, that's any, right. I'm terrified. Oh, any contemporary equivalents to Millet? Oh God, I mean, I well, actually, um, in turn, well, the, the problem is that she's she's such a, a various poet in many ways. In, in terms of playing with a persona and that sense of um both being uh so so a kind of like cool smart a aloof surface but then uh, a vulnerability behind that and th this you know like glistening sharp steely facade with with cracks in it someone who i think is a really interesting and exciting poet um there's a poet called phoebe stooks whose first book, Platinum Blonde, came out last year, and I, I, I've been rereading that a bit recently. And I, I think you could see a, a certain kind of similarity of stance in, in, in some of her poetry to that stance that Malay adopts, particularly in some of her sonnets. Mm -mm -mm. Yes, I think the, you also mention um, in the, in, at the same time, you talk about Hera Lindsay Bird, and I think that's a, I think that's a good parallel as well. Yeah, I think Hira, I mean, the, oh God, I mean, there's such different poets in so many ways. But I think the thing that Hira Lindsay Bird does, which Malay also manages to do, is the trick of being kind of simultaneously ironic and heartfelt. And being able to balance those, to, to, that, that balancing act is something I think is, is very hard to pull off well. And in their very different ways, I think it's something they both do. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, 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 that. That high, that arch um, irony, or that arch detachment, but that actually also, you know, really being devastated. <laughs> mm. This makes me think about. I can't, of course, I, I can't quite call to mind the line that that, that thing that said about Holly Go Lightly in, in Breakfast at Tiffany's, where, where someone's saying, I, "I know what you want to know. Is the kid a phony? It, but she's a real phony." Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um. Okay. Um. So uh, Katie Evans Bush, hi Katie, um, um, would like some discussion about Millet's place in, within the context of uh, modernism. She says that she thinks the sonnets um, and her use of archaic language have made her unfashionable at times as people judge or are scared off by form. I think that that's, I, I think that particularly the use of archaic language in the sonnets and a, a perception of her as being a, a traditional poet, a formerly traditional poet in some ways, is something that may be counted against her in the second half of the 20th century in the academy when uh, the usual way to make a case for a poet's importance in, in some circles was to say to what extent were they, you know, 
it, furthering the project of modernism, or to what extent were they something that modernism had to bulldoze past? But so I, I think when, when you really get to grips with the work, she's actually a much more formally, formally inventive poet than she's given credit for being. And in some of her later lyric poems, which I've included in here, she does fantastic things with line length. But there's, there's one poem in here, which is a 14 line poem, where every line rhymes with another line in the poem. So you might say, aha, it's a sonnet. But it sounds like no other sonnet on earth. She'll take a line for a walk. For, for if you read it aloud, it could take you 20 seconds to get through it. And it's, it seems to kind of this fantastic trick of seeing how long a rhyme can remain in the memory. And any, any poet with a less uh, acute musical ear wouldn't be able to get away with it. But yeah. she can kind of just e extend things. It's like watching someone with, with a yo-yo that just keeps descending. You're never quite sure when it's going to jolt back up towards the hand. So I, I think there's more, and you could you could see see that. I mean, and if another poet had written it, people might call it a modernist deconstruction of the son. And <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I, I I think she's a more formally inventive and more modern, if not always modernist poet than she's given credit for being. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and uh, a question from uh, Robert. Hamburger, um, who would like to know what, what do you think um, of, I mean, for starters, do you agree with this, I guess, but, um, but what do you think of accounts, um, or what do you think accounts for um, the critical neglect until recently since her death? I mean, it's, it's a broad question. I think it's perhaps different in America to how it is in the UK. Mm -hmm. I think it has always been the case that there's more of a struggle to uh, kind of canonize female writers in every time and context than male writers. I think there are contemporary. Oh no! Are you still with us, Tristram? That was a very dramatic exit. Um, hmm. Well, we have uh, one minute left, so perhaps uh, <laughs> that was I can actually see that Tristram is still here on our list of panelists. So, um, I mean, hopefully, he can come back and finish his sentence. Um, but I mean, sadly, we are at time. So um, I'm going to jump in and thank you guys all for being here. I really hope that Tristram can hear me. He's still on the list. So Tristram, I hope you can hear me because I want to say thank you. Oh, he's actually disappeared. Maybe you're right, Abby. Maybe his phone has died. Um, so to everyone else, thank you for being here. Um, thank you, Abby, for reading for us so beautifully um, and for your great chat. Um, and thank you guys for being such a great audience. Oh. She's back. Yeah. <laughs> hi. Um, hi. I'm so hi. sorry about that. My, my phone just abruptly died. Luckily, I've got my laptop open at the same time. I think we're talking about Malay's uh, critical neglect. Um, I, I do think that that is something which is changing. Uh, there was a kind of resurgence of interest in her around the early 90s, around the time of her centenary. Um, I think, I, I think something that's interesting and that there's still more work to be done on is, there's, uh, is her influence on the kind of generations of writers who came after her, which I, I, I think uh, Sylvia Plath wrote interestingly ab about um, sort of seeing, seeing Malay as a figure who she could become. And there's a tension of influence there, perhaps, uh, in, in some respects of both admiring qualities in her work uh, as a kind of younger reader of poems, and then wanting to be something different as a writer. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd like to think that, to kind of put an optimistic uh, spin on it, that we're in the middle of a, a kind of Malay Renaissance. There are Holly Pepe, who, who asked the first question this evening, who is, I was actually part of the reason I'm so nervous is that she's one of the kind of leading scholars of Malay's work, and I believe Malay's executor. Um, is has also been involved with the publication of a couple of books coming out next year from Yale Press. There's, there's a new edition of her letters and also her diaries are, are going to be published, I think, in February, which should hopefully lead to 
more people taking an interest in and, and discovering Malay's work. I should say that, uh, I mean, I, I, I was feeling a little nervous and I spoke to Tristram about an hour before this event and he conveyed this to me and we both became incredibly nervous. <laughs> Thanks, Tristram. <laughs> um, thank you guys so much. And I'm so pleased that you could pop up again, Tristram, and <laughs> finish off your final comments. Um, and I'm glad it was an optimistic note. You guys need to help us with our renaissance of Malay's work. You must now go and buy your book, as Tristram said, a knockdown price. Um, I'm putting the link in the chat for you. You've got your discount code there. Um, please go to the website. Please buy a book. Um, please tell everyone you know to buy a copy of the book. Um, so that's everything from us, really. Um, I'm going to leave the chat open so that you can access that link and you can put your final messages in there. Um, so I'll just leave that open for a few more minutes for you guys. Uh, but really, just thank you all for being here. Thanks so much, Tristram, for this evening. It's been really wonderful. Um, and thanks again, Abby. Congratulations on the new book. Um, what else do I need to tell you guys? I don't know. <laughs> um, please join us again next week. We're going to do another book launch next week. Um, we're launching uh, the new collection from Tagara Mozanenemo. Um, it's called Verga. It's a poetry society, uh, poetry book society recommendation. It's a really remarkable book. Um, please join us on Wednesday night. All the details are on the website. Um, if you can't access the code to buy your copy of the Millet right now, get in touch with me um, and we can sort that out for you. So um, that's everything. Thank you guys so much. Um, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having us. Thank you. <laughs>